So uh, the idea of this uh, whole series of presentations is to to very steadily and uh, and uh, passionately uh, attempt to celebrate uh, very important architects and. <laughs> Fate was generous, but also uh, troubling in a way because fate made it possible for uh, uh, for a number of geniuses to be born almost every day. So this keep, keeps me very busy. Today we have uh, Etienne Louis Boulet, and tomorrow, not tomorrow, but the day after tomorrow will be Alberti. I mean, it is a pleasure, but it is also a responsibility because it is not easy to talk about uh, the greatest, but it is the most challenging and the most enticing and inciting. So, um, you know, uh, as a desiderata, at least, uh, um, it, uh, it, uh, uh, it, it cannot easily be, uh, uh, you know, uh, rejected or uh, unaddressed. So I begin with Etienne Louis Boulet. 1728, 1799, so he died at 71. He is usually associated, as you know, with Ledoux. Uh, about both of them, uh, Louis Kahn wrote very uh, uh, movingly when uh, invited to write a foreword to uh, an exhibition or a book or both on uh, Boulet and Ledoux, uh, or Ledoux and Boulet. Louis Kahn wrote, and I don't have a great memory and I don't memorize easily poems. But this is the only one actually, this is the only one I memorized. Spirit in will to express can make the great sun seem small. The sun is thus the universe. Did we need Bach? Bach is thus music is. Did we need Boulet? Did we need Ledoux? Boulet is, Ledoux is, thus architecture is. This is what Louis Kahn wrote. An emotionally committed neoclassicism. This is how someone um, uh, described uh, the works of, of Boulet. Interesting conjunction here, you know, uh, emotional, I mean, emotions and neoclassicism. Neoclassicism doesn't usually um, evoke uh, too many emotions, or at least not uh, uh, obviously or apparently, but uh, I, I like oxymorons, so I, I, I like these um, uh, difficult conjunctions between emotions and neoclassicism. So he was a so-called visionary French neoclassical architect whose work greatly influenced contemporary architects, meaning architects of the present. As you can see, he was born on this day, but in 1728, eight, uh, seven years from now, uh, will uh, hopefully pay homage to his uh, 300th birthday. So, uh, but, you know, when you see the word visionary, um, this is, a, uh, to use a word I very often uh, neglect to, I mean, I, I do not use visionary. It, it, it's a word we, we usually use when we don't understand something. So then we label it uh, visionary. It's a tricky word, and sorry for the word tricky. Uh, this is a word I very rarely use. In fact, I almost never use it, but I use it now. Uh, you know, what does it mean, vision, you know, actually? In a certain way, any, any good architect or any good poet or any go, good uh, anything is to an extent at least so-called visionary. Uh, but maybe he was a little more than others. Boulet's fondness for grandiose designs has caused him to be characterized as both a megalomaniac and a visionary. His focus on polarity, this is interesting, offsetting opposite design all elements and the use of light and shadow was highly innovative and continues to influence architects to this day. He was rediscovered in the 20th century and has influenced recent architects such as Aldo Rossi. Well, this text was written uh, you know, uh, some some years ago, there are other uh, influences more recent, but uh, yes, there was a certain influence on Rossi as well. Uh, this is a, a, a work I couldn't find pictures of, um, but this one apparently is the only uh, uh, known built work by him that uh, stands uh, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll take a look at it. We'll have some pictures. 
but Boulet is, is, is as you know, he's um, uh, highly significant and very well known because of his projects, because of, of his drawings, not because of what he built. Ledoux built a little more, but uh, even in the case of Ledoux, perhaps the most inciting part of his work is the one that was that remained at the level of, um, of a project. So Hotel Alexandre, also known as Hotel Sue, is a hotel part particulier in the eighth uh, arrondissement of Paris, uh, France, designed by uh, Etienne Louis Boulet. The building was constructed from 1763 to 1766 and is the best surviving structure designed by Boulet. Uh, sorry for the resolution of this. Uh, this is a rendering. Uh, you know, this is uh, not very visionary actually, but uh, this is what happens. Visions when they, when they arrive at uh, being executed become less visionary. Um, Unfortunately, anyway, it is a it is a building that uh, where where he he had something to say. I don't know exactly to what extent, and I don't I don't know if there were no some uh, there was there there wasn't some kind of uh, change in time. It doesn't seem to, but uh, all in all, <laughs> this is very different from the Senator for Newton, uh, for example. Anyway. Um, Yes, this is neoclassical architecture. Uh, it's true. And I don't know if it is very emotionally charged. It is a balanced, harmonious, uh, you know, so-called neoclassical architecture. Now uh, we have a building, a picture of this building of an important photographer, Eugène Adje, uh, uh, truly uh, an important uh, uh, photographer. Um, but uh, all photographs in general for someone who is nostalgic um, uh, are, are uh, you know, uh, provoke uh, emotional reactions. Now we, 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 we go to this very important work by him, uh, maybe the most important work, the one that makes him still uh, an, uh, an enigma in a way. This cenotaph for Sir Isaac Newton from 1784. Um, I will read a short text about it. He promoted the idea of making architecture expressive of its purpose, a doctrine that his detractors termed architecture parlante. I don't know exactly why, uh, you know, uh, someone who was a detractor called uh, this architecture architecture parlante as if an ar architecture parlante is to be derided. I don't understand very well, but anyway, which was an essential element in Beaux-Arts architectural training in the later 19th century. Well, we are in the 18th century, not in the 19th. So I, I don't know, some of these texts uh, are not very scrupulously written. His style was most notably exemplified in his proposal for a cenotaph, a funerary monument celebrating a figure interred elsewhere for the English scientist Isaac Newton who 50 years after his death became a symbol of enlightenment ideas. Now, interesting that it is uh, mentioned the enlightenment because uh, I mean, there are paradoxes here. Is, is truly Boulet uh, uh, an architect of the enlightenment? It's debatable and uh, we, 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 we perhaps should talk about this. The building itself was a 150 meters tall sphere taller than the great pyramids of Giza, that's not a little thing, encompassed by two large barriers circled by hundreds of cypress trees. Now you probably know the cypress tree was always used, you know, for funeral, uh, for, you know, it was connected with death. Uh, <clears throat> the massive and spheric shape of the building was inspired by Boulet's own study called the theory of bodies where he claims that the most beautiful and perfect natural body is the sphere, which is the most preeminent element of the Newton Memorial. Though the structure was never built, Boulet had many ink and wash drawings engraved and circulated widely in the professional circles in 1784. The small sarcophagus, sarcophagus for Newton is placed at the lower pole of the sphere. The design of the memorial is intended to create the effect of day and night. 
The night effect occurs when the sarcophagus is illuminated by the sunlight coming through the holes in the vaulting, giving the illusion of stars in the night sky. The day effect is an armillary sphere hanging in the center that gives off a mysterious glow. Thus, the use of light in the building's design causes the building's interior to change its appearance. Uh, yes, we cannot say that this is one of the most modest buildings in the world. Uh, it seems Boulet believed uh, a lot in, uh, in uh, Sir Isaac Newton. Um, and um, in a certain way, it's a little bit strange, you know, that, that a Frenchman uh, uh, celebrates, pays homage to a, you know, a British man so eloquently, so idealistically. But uh, I, I, th I don't think here is a question of frontiers or national frontiers. In a way, this monument is, 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 uh, is a summum of, 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 of the longings of humankind beyond the biographies, uh, the specific biographies or uh, the specific names. Uh, it's, it has a cosmic uh, uh, aspiration. This is what I see here. Uh, it, it, it's a building that is uh, an emblem for uh, 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 an attempt to unite life with death in a way, an attempt to, to, to transcend the limitations of, of human life. And uh, maybe this very aspiration is something that, that, that could inspire us and should inspire us maybe, because we, we, we live kind of a, in a, in a self-imposed uh, isolation. We are not connected with the cosmos. Uh, at best, uh, we are so-called environmentalists, but as uh, Buckminster Fuller said, uh, the environment is everything outside of us without us, while cosmos is everything outside of us plus us. So what I see here is, is, is something where the word cosmos cannot easily be avoided. But the word cosmos in Greek means order. So anyway, uh, it's a complex subject. Uh, but all in all, this is also a very contemporary design. This is not, this is not uh, 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 you know, entrapped in the, in the aesthetics of the 18th century. I would say that you know, if Aldo Rossi was inspired uh, or influenced by Boulet to an extent, uh, and if we are uh, uh, moved by the drawings of Boulet, it's exactly because Boulet was able to move beyond the, the temporal limitations of the 18th century, of his century. Uh, and, um, you know, that's why also Louis Kahn responded so uh, eloquently to, to the works of Boulet and also the works of Ledoux. Uh, so there is a quest here that transcends time. In fact, I would say that this is an ahistorical architecture. It's beyond Kronos. This is an ahistorical, atemporal architecture. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, he was obviously concerned with the ultimate, uh, you know, truth or knowledge or uh, awareness. We, we can use all kinds of words. Uh, it is a dream, of course, that we are looking at a dream. But we need these dreams. We need, I think, architects like Boulet in the world uh, uh, because they continue to inspire, because they tell us something that, that, that transcends time. And uh, um, this is one of the, the graphic works in architecture that do have this power. To, 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 to speak to anyone in any century. It's very possible that this drawing could have been understood by Heraclitus in as much it could be understood by someone in the year 3000s. And maybe this is something we should aspire towards. If a, if a poet or a writer uh, attempts to write in such a way that uh, uh, maybe Sophocles uh, would have liked it, or, or, or Homer, but also Ibsen, Proust, and, uh, you know, uh, a future poet or writer. I think architects should do this too, although, of course, uh, for a building to last for such a long time um, is uh, problematic. But uh, 
doesn't really matter if the physical necessities, I mean, the physical restrictions of life, uh, um, you know, uh, make uh, lasting uh, uh, very, very difficult. After all, not all buildings should be like the Egyptian pyramids and also the Egyptian pyramids are themselves have a certain degree of vulnerability. They are, they are not uh, as eternal as we'd like them to think they are. Anyway, it is about centrality, clearly. I mean, this is an architecture that uh, uh, advocates the cause of centrality, a powerful uh, centrality. Uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, the French culture does have, even Perret, I would say, uh, has uh, um, a certain liking for, uh, for centrality. And, and, and this exists in the French culture even in the planning of, of Paris. Uh, I'm not talking about the medieval Paris, but, but uh, you know, it, it's, it's this, the interesting tension, the, 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 in a way, the disjunction between authority and rebelliousness. And the French are very, very known for both. They had great emperors, and you know we shouldn't mention just Louis Le Soleil, but there, are, there is a long line of uh, you know strong hierarchies in, in in the French history and culture. But they also had Liberté, Galité, Fraternité, the protest. They had the Bastille, but they also had uh, the revolutionaries who uh, broke down uh, the prison. So. Anyway, but by the way, I want to show because it, uh, for me, uh, the past, the so-called past, the one that interests me is the one that doesn't pass. Uh, and uh, because of it, I want to show two works that relate to Boulet, but uh, belong to the present. One is this uh, cent so it's a cultural center in Tijuana of all places. Uh, that was inspired, uh, obviously, maybe too obviously, by the cenotaph by Boulet. Uh, of course, you know, the, the sphere was used in architecture in many ways, uh, even a, in a project by Ledoux, and uh, we can give countless examples. But somehow this one in Tijuana is, um, you know, uh, evoking uh, the, the, the project uh, for Newton uh, by uh, Boulet. And it's kind of, I almost, today is the day with uh, unusual words for me. I, I use the word tricky and now I use the word funny. It's almost funny that this, this work finds its place in Tijuana, which is a, a place in Mexico, the frontier with the United States, which doesn't have uh, really the reputation of a highly uh, cultural uh, or cultured uh, place. But, uh, you know, life is full of surprises. So here we have it. Um, and uh, yes, it's not really Newton cenotaph, but uh, uh, it's a sphere. It's a big opaque sphere that uh, rhetorically seems to say something different from what this uh, glorious sign of McDonald uh, says. And not just it, but uh, other things around. Anyway, um, like a, a short intermezzo uh, relating to uh, relating to Boulet. If Boulet arrived even in Tijuana, it could arrive in other places as well. Now. Uh, I show a project by Boulet, uh, the deuxième projet pour la bibliothèque du roi from 1785. Uh, this is a famous uh, project for a, you know, a royal, a royal library. If there ever was one, this is it. Boulet didn't settle for uh, uh, small things, as you can see. This was supposed to be the library of libraries, and uh, it was not built, but uh, the project is still commanding our attention. Uh, at the bottom, we see human figures engaged in uh, scholastic uh, debates or discussions. Uh, this kind of life perhaps uh, is difficult to find these days, you know, because we, we banished uh, Vita Contemplativa. 
Yes, we have books. Yes, we have scholars. Yes, we have libraries. But something is missing. Uh, I, I, I didn't see such scenes in any library I went to uh, these days. And I don't think, because he, you know, here knowledge all, almost becomes uh, uh, physical. I mean, please be kind and turn off the microphone because I, uh, I talk freely and I have to be very, very, um, um, you know, uh, attentive. Otherwise I, I, I could say foolish things and I, I don't want to do this too often. Uh, thank you. So, uh, why is it that we don't have such libraries these days, you know, because we have the books, we have the buildings, but something is missing, you know, I mean, here there is a physicality, almost like a physical engagement with, with knowledge, you know, here someone draws on the floor, one is on his knees looking at what, it's, it's like an, in the Platonic Academy, Plato's Academy painted by Raphael, uh, and uh, it, it, it's a different conception about life, I think. It, it is about, uh, 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 as I said, the contemplative life, vita contemplativa, we, we, which we kind of, I mean, maybe more than kind of, we do ignore these days. Um, there is a website, a uh, French website, uh, that, that analyzes in detail all these projects. There are all kinds of uh, interesting uh, details about it. I'm not very good ab about transmitting or, or storing uh, a lot of information, uh, but I, I, my attempt is, attempt is to, to transmit not so much information, but inspiration, if possible. Uh, so, Boulez and Bill Plus de la Bibliothèque du Roi, la Rue Colbert. Uh, it was not built, but uh, he made the project nevertheless. I, I say this to the students, even if you cannot build, even if you don't have um, the so-called beneficiaries or clients, you can still draw, you can still model, you can do it digitally or manually. It's your duty and your pleasure, uh, if you are an architect, to imagine worlds. And, and if you do it intensely, and if you have something to say, one day, 200 years from now, someone, someone will talk about your project. As we talk now about the project uh, by Boulet. Uh, this is a scene from, uh, from Raphael's um, uh, painting. Uh, you see here Michelangelo turning his back on the others. Here Plato and there are all kinds of, I don't know if one of these, I don't know if this one is not uh, uh, actually Raphael. He do, did look like a, like a young woman. Uh, there are all kinds of uh, interesting historical and uh, figures from, uh, from the glory of the, the ancient, uh, ancient world. And here you can compare a fragment of, of uh, Boulez's uh, project with what uh, Raphael uh, um, depicted. And I, I would say that somehow if we can regain something of this world in, in, our, uh, in our present, uh, it will be a gain, I think. Uh, you know, just uh, to arrive at knowledge for the sake of knowledge, not for the sake of using that knowledge to, I don't know, for something lucrative to make a better refrigerator or I don't know what. No. Knowledge for the sake of knowledge. Uh, as I imagine this man who reads this uh, from this little book, uh, is he He's searching for knowledge. He's not searching for, I mean, of course I'm imagining, but uh, I, I like to believe that I'm not totally wrong. I mean, look at this person here, you know, investigating the, 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 the almost sphere called Earth. It's, it's about the joy of discovery and the joy of, of, of learning, but not necessarily with a you know, a, a definite or, a, you know, precise goal. Um, I think our education today is, 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 is uh, detrimental exactly because it excludes uh, knowledge for the sake of knowledge, you know, for the, for the joy, for the beauty even of, 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 of learning because of the, of the worthiness of, of learning, you know, and not for uh, some little lucrative uh, goal. We are too goal oriented, you know, but uh, I, I do believe in what Einstein said that uh, play is the, 
the best research. Playing is the best research. Anyway, uh, the section is kind of strange now because it's almost like a little house, but you saw the scale, it's huge. Anyway, now we arrive at a work uh, which is uh, not in Tijuana, is in China and is by MVRDV and it is without doubt uh, connected uh, with the works of Boulet, the imagined works by Boulet. Uh, again, the sphere is, seems to be unavoidable, but this one is a library. Uh, I'm, I'm almost sure you know this work. It was highly publicized. It, it seems to be animated by a, by a certain amount of idealism, uh, but it's, it's still different somehow from the, uh, from the work of Poulet. Uh, there is a, a level of uh, rhetorics here that 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 uh, that is a little bit uh, uh, unsettling me. Uh, you know, I mean, we look at these books here, almost on the ceiling. I understand that the book wants to come back to the wall and even to the ceiling, because, as Victor Hugo said, uh, <clears throat> uh, Gutenberg. Uh, or the book, the book killed the cathedral. Once the books became, began to be published uh, in, in large numbers, uh, the message that was written in the walls of the cathedral, if we are to talk about Europe and, and the cathedrals, uh, became uh, almost unnecessary. So the knowledge was removed from the walls of the of the of the of the sacred buildings of the cathedrals into the into the books and now the book is assaulted by the digital uh, medias and technologies so who knows maybe the book in fact that's what we witness here the book is coming back to the wall it wants to become a wall again but this is what i see here i mean many of these books are unreachable so it is as if knowledge wants to regain its lost physicality, to become wall or ceiling or whatever, roof uh, again. And this is an interesting uh, uh, phenomenon. It's rather recent. And uh, it is as if we try to reclaim l'architecture parlante. Uh, on the other hand, it's also, I think, a crisis of the book which I think goes through a, a sunset effect because the sun is at its most splendid when it sets. Well, it's the same with a book now. It sets, it's not so necessary any longer and becomes almost an ornament, a decoration. But what else is here? It, it's obviously a decoration. This is a book which will never be read if it, remain, if it remains here. And so, uh, yes, we have uh, countless books like never before in the world, but strangely and almost paradoxically, we have less and less time to read them. Although <laughs> uh, technology and science make all the efforts in the world to have uh, to, to make us have more and more free time. But the paradox is that we actually have less and less time. Uh, it doesn't matter, new vacuum cleaner, uh, uh, vacuum cleans, even if we don't touch it and uh, we just think of touching it and it begins alone to, uh, you know, uh, clean up the apartment and so on. But, but this library uh, by MVRDV is, uh, is uh, it, 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 on one hand, is, is, a, is a positive, uh, um, you know, other, albeit a little bit uh, rhetorical, uh, uh, you know, display of, 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 of the meeting between architecture and knowledge. Uh, but um, on the other hand, I think it shows what I try to describe through the words, the sunset effect. Um, it, I mean, look at this, who is here? As opposed to the project by Boulet, where we saw people there engaging in debates, uh, debating ideas, here, there is no one. I mean, in this fragment of the picture, or we, we see, you know, uh, families uh, uh, meandering through the building with children. Is But it's not really a quest for knowledge. The library became, uh, I mean, yes, people look through books, but they look just like I do. You know, I just uh, 
look for a few minutes through a book and then put it aside and then pick up another book and do the same with it. It's, it's, uh, it's not the same attitude vis-a-vis -vis learning as we saw it in the, in the project by Boulet. Otherwise, the architecture, yes, is, uh, you know, rather, rather impressive, although I don't know exactly what is happening in this sphere. In the case of uh, Boulet, we knew what it was. It was a cenotaph for, for a great scientist. But what is going on here? I hope it's not a storage room for the, the information desk or something. Uh, I'm very curious. Uh, I didn't analyze the project, so I don't know, but this sphere located as it is here should have a special function, although I'm not a functionalist, far from it, but it would be rather cynical not to have just a storage space for, uh, uh, you know, things relating to the, the information desk. Anyway, uh, I, if I am to be a little bit cynical, I wonder now looking at this picture, why didn't they make an ice skating ring here so people can ice skate around the sphere here. Um, well, it almost looks like an ice skating ring because of the, the you know, the glittering uh, uh, floor. It's an interesting project by MVRTV, but I, I'm not very sure that um, it addresses in depth uh, the problem of, uh, of the book today. Other projects and drawings by Boulet, uh, he didn't, I mean, look, the human silhouettes are here and this is the building. I mean, uh, it's clear that this building is not, uh, uh, it has different concerns than uh, these little ants, human ants who uh, gather uh, at its base. Uh, it, he built for the gods in a way, for unknown gods, or uh, I don't know exactly, uh, it is a quest for the infinite, for the absolute. Uh, this seems to be clear to me. But if you ask me what is the infinite and what is the absolute, I'm not sure I could answer. Um, anyway, uh, he was, as, as you remember, he was described as a me megalomaniac or and uh, a visionary. Uh, well, you know, uh, the two seem to go together, no? Uh, so, here is another example of uh, immodest uh, architecture. <laughs> I mean, in a strange way, now I, I, I'm speculating and I'm improvising, and I apologize for it if I, if I get it wrong. But what I see in this project, in these drawings, is some kind of a conjunction, some kind of a marriage, some kind of a, uh, yeah, a, a marriage between uh, the empire and democracy, because here you have, uh, uh, it, 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 it's an architecture that is, is uh, you know, uh, so huge and so centralized that, that it's difficult to divorce it from, uh, uh, you know, hierarchical, uh, political, uh, social, uh, uh, you know, realities of the human society. On the other hand, being so huge Somehow it transcends even the individuality of Louis Le Soleil. It becomes a, 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 public, a public thing, le fait c'est nous. Not le fait c'est moi, but le fait c'est nous. And so in this sense, I have a feeling that Boulet achieved in his drawings, in, in his proposals. I mean, look at the human beings here. You know, they, they, they are almost not noticeable. So. You know, even an emperor here would be a little ant. Louis Le Soleil would be a little dot here. So this building, this project transcends uh, any individuality. As such, I would say they, 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 they evoke uh, a publicness. And so they are strangely democratic, so to speak, exactly when they are at their utmost uh, imperialistic almost. Uh, I don't know if I, I described well what my intuition is at this, at this point about this, something like this. But it, it is clear that in his projects, Boulet uh, didn't have small concerns. It's really a dialogue between Boulet and the infinite. Um, 
Okay, Etienne Louis Boulet and Etienne Louis Boulet and his uh, famous uh, unbuilt uh, library, uh, another project, I forgot what this was about. Um, I think uh, it is written somewhere here in the presentation. But all in all, we are dealing with mega structures that, uh, that um, uh, transcend uh, you know, the, the coordinates of a human life uh, that is measurable uh, and, and limited and, and finite. There is some kind of celestial expression is here, not so much in this project, but uh, I don't know if if any anyone use such words, um, you know, celestial expression is. Maybe, you know, if I think of the drawings of Hans Scharun or some drawings by Hans Pelzig, uh, the German expressionist, or, or Bruno Taut with his Alpine architecture, it was that emphatic quest for the beyond. And Boulet had it in a different way, of course, because he was French, not German. This is a project for an opera house, but what am I saying an opera house? The opera house. You know, this was not any opera house. In fact, this project would have been uh, uh, impossible to locate within a city, uh, not even in China. Uh, this. This this was meant to be I don't know where actually it's it's uh, not contextual it is not connected to history it's connected to a history and uh, it's it's the paradigmatic the ultimate the fundamental the ur opera house uh, the one and only it was not built but uh, if it was built it all the other opera houses would have looked uh, almost ridiculously pathetical. Uh, pathetically um, circumstantial and ephemeral and transitory and uh, in, in the end insignificant. Uh, now this is a plan for a museum. Again, he didn't design a museum. This is the museum, the one and the only. <laughs> uh, and I think that's how all his works are. Uh, here is a, you know, a vertical, uh, maybe uh, uh, Aldo Rossi uh, knew uh, about something like this. He used, but of course, in much smaller versions, um, something uh, a little bit similar. Okay, enough with Boulet. Happy birthday, Etienne Louis Boulet. And now we go to a very good, very good uh, French architect, another French architect, uh, Auguste Perret. I admire Perret a lot because I think, uh, uh, well, he was an exceptional uh, architect and uh, he worked with concrete uh, magnificently. He was, uh, you know, 150 years uh, younger, so to speak, uh, than, uh, than, um, than Boulet, more than 150 years. Uh, no, 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 uh, no, I am wrong. So he died, uh, Boulet, in 1799, I think, and this is 1874. So all in all, uh, about 100 years later, Auguste Perret. Here is Architet, <laughs> an interesting, uh, you know, uh, branch from the, from the word uh, architect, but uh, written like this, Architet. Uh, and uh, yeah, Auguste Perret, uh, born, as you see, the 12th of February, 1874, uh, was a French, he was a little bit younger than, um, than uh, Le Corbusier, the paradigmatic uh, European architect, was a French architect and the pioneer of the architectural use of reinforced concrete. His major works include the Théâtre des Champs-Élysées, the first Art Deco building in Paris, the Church of Notre Dame du Rancy, the Mobilier National in Paris, uh, and the French Economic, Social, and Environmental Council building in Paris. Well, he built other buildings, and you are going to see them. After World War II, he designed a group of buildings in the center of the port city of Le Havre, including Saint jo Joseph uh, Church. St. Joseph Church in Le Havre to replace buildings destroyed by bombing during World War II. His reconstruction of the city, meaning Le Havre, 
is now a World Heritage Site, not a little thing. Uh, this is a drawing that he himself did. Uh, I like his uh, ideogram, uh, his uh, cryptical uh, uh, signature. I think he was a, a very interesting and, and, and complex man, uh, not uh, unvisited by maybe some uh, dark uh, um, gods from time to time capable of melancholia, if we are to look a little bit at, at his profile. Well, a, a melancholic who works with the reinforced concrete, I think uh, almost by definition is an interesting man. Uh, and uh, here he is, uh, an accomplished architect uh, and um, aware of his accomplishments, uh, dressed well as a, as a true Frenchman and looking confidently into the future, but not, I would say, not arrogantly, no. Now, we, we begin with this work from 1902. Uh, so he was, how old was he? He was uh, born in, uh, I forgot, uh, 1874. So 26 plus uh, um, uh, two, uh, 28 years old when he started this building. And this building still stands in Paris and uh, is a very interesting building. Uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a building uh, uh, that uh, clearly asserts uh, the, 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 the beginning of a, a professional uh, uh, trajectory that was not to be neglected. I mean, if a man at 26 designs something like this in a city like Paris and builds it, uh, we better notice. Um, and uh, I don't know why I thought now of Balzac. Balzac was running away from his uh, creditors. Balzac, a, 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 a giant in literature, but uh, he was also a giant spender and he would borrow money from uh, all kinds of sources and then he was unable to pay back he would buy uh, luxuries, you know, like, um, I don't know who said this, Oscar Wilde, that uh, give me the luxuries in life and I'll, I'll give up on the necessities. I think it was kind of the same with, with Balzac. And somehow looking at this building, but it wasn't in this building really, but also a, a building, I don't know why I am thinking of, of, of Balzac now, uh, uh, but I'm sure he didn't hide in a building by, by um, uh, Perret. It's kind of funny, I'm thinking of Balzac, you know, running away from his creditors, uh, <laughs> changing his physiognomy probably, his name, everything, hiding behind curtains. This is, this is the ridiculous side of greatness, you know, a great writer, no? Balzac, a genius. But, but he had his ridiculous side because he, he had to handle walking on earth, as Baudelaire would say, which is so difficult for the albatross. The albatross can fly, but it cannot walk. So it's the same with Balzac and maybe even the same with, uh, with Perret. I don't know. Architects in general are more adapted to life than the poets or writers or musicians and so on. It's a great building. I mean, look at the, look, I mean, you know, it's, it's not just the, the geometry of the building, but also the textures and uh, it has a richness. The skin of the building is rich, it's not sleek, it's not simplistic. Uh, it, it communicates, it vibrates. It's a skin that, that, that yes, sorry, the detractors of uh, Boulet uh, is parlant. Um, and uh, even the drawing, I mean, look at the drawing. It's a fine drawing. Uh, and, and this seems to be the, 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 the original drawing, uh, one of the plans um, drawn by, um, uh, by Perret, Auguste Perret. Um, Rue Franklin. Um, yes, it's, 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 it's a fine building, it's a fine plan, it's a fine everything. At that time, people still believed in the beauty of a plan. You know, they were not like Massimiliano Fuchsas, who said, never the plan, never the facade, maybe the section. Well, <laughs> for uh, Auguste Perret and many people, uh, maybe almost all people, always thought of having a nice, harmonious, beautiful plan where the functions are properly honored and expressed. 
uh, but uh, the rebelliousness of the end of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st um, problematize such uh, convictions. Um, all in all, uh, this is a building that uh, is not uh, is not uh, is not to be ignored, and um, I think his handling of concrete is 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 very robust. is is very robust. is masculine. is vigorous. is vivacious almost, uh, uh, but it's also uh, rigorous and strict. Uh, it, I like Perret because he's able to marry somehow, uh, uh, um, um, you know, a, a strict geometry with a, uh, with a with with something that that, that is not dry. So in, in in his case, I think uh, uh, geometry is 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 able to warm up somehow. Maybe we can uh, we can see this better with the next works. This is a, a garage Pontieu in Paris from 1907. Uh, it's a garage, but it's a garage which makes it and made it into the pages of, uh, of uh, the histories of architecture. Can you believe it? Yes, believe it. A garage could could be part of the pages of the histories of architecture. And not just a garage, in fact, anything, a fence, anything, if it's done properly, if it's done well with creativity and passion, intensity, uh, it could become architecture. It doesn't have to be a cathedral. It could be anything, even a garage. And uh, look at this. Interior is, is, is still uh, inciting and interesting and uh, it's engineering, but it's not just engineering. It's it's architecture, and the outside as well. You know, this is. It doesn't matter what kind of cars you put here. The building is still proclaiming its status as being the work of an architect, not just a builder, but an architect. What is the difference between a building and an architecture? Well, it is a difference. If I am to refer again to Paul Valéry, who, who said that El Palinos or the architect is the one who makes the stone sink. Sorry for repeating myself from Paul Valéry. I, I mentioned this a few times uh, and I should stop now because then I could be uh, annoying for those who hear me uh, too often uh, mentioning this. Here, of course, uh, I, I could be asked in what way are the stones singing here, and I probably would become silent because I, I don't know if I could answer. But I just had this feeling that this interior uh, has character, has uh, force, has beauty, has even sensitivity. And the cars are, you know, they, they are here or they could not be here, still the building um, has something to say architecturally, and even the facade, you know, it, it's it, it's a facade that uh, intrigues. That, in other words, we are dealing with with architecture, not with a building, not just with a building. Even the old pictures, you see, the cars are very different, but everything is still somehow inciting for someone who loves architecture, who is interested in architecture. I don't know what it is. Is the order, is the space, is the light. All these things together make us appreciate what, whatever the word architecture means. The plan, you look at the plan, you look at the plan, but you look, uh, look, look, at, look at this. It, there is a distance between the plan the plan is static, it's almost placid, it's frigid, but the reality of the building is not. Théâtre des Champs-Élysées, uh, um, this is a building, I actually was inside this um, uh, building once. It's not a, my favorite buildings about, uh, by Perron, Perrin, sorry, uh, but um, you know, it, it's a theater in Paris, uh, in a central location. It's not a big theater. Uh, it's, um, uh, but uh, this one, I think, is a little bit less, uh, less uh, challenging or provoking or, or uh, inciting than some other uh, buildings by him. 
maybe because it 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 it, it was uh, um, concerned, I guess, with um, you know the the urban context, the urban fabric, uh, you know the base reliefs are perhaps a little bit too you know figurative or literal. I don't see too much uh, rebellion in this building, but uh, not I, anyway. He was an architect who. Uh, was in between two worlds in a way. He announced modernity, but uh, he was not yet uh, that radical force that uh, uh, he probably would have been capable of being actually. The interior though is very bourgeois, but uh, many times, even now, you, you know, you look at uh, so-called uh, very innovative buildings by med architects, opera houses and so on, and not just by them. And the interior is uh, almost unavoidable. Uh, it uses uh, red burgundy and uh, velvet and, uh, you know, especially for an opera house. So uh, the, in the interior, the, 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 the these locations that uh, avant-garde gestures uh, make are not so easily uh, uh, made. That could be actually an interesting uh, idea, perhaps, or, or, or activity to, to, to create an opera house which uh, inside uh, ref uh, rejects uh, the, the bourgeois paradigm. But, but how do you do it? And you might be able to do it, but, uh, <laughs> but then it will remain a, an empty, uh, glorious space, probably. Anyway, um, so. This is the Le Théâtre de Champs Élysées by uh, by Perret. Um, we, there are other works, in my opinion, which are more, uh, um, you know, for the taste of the one who likes uh, the disjunctions of uh, rebelliousness. Uh, the plan. What what can we do? You know, it's uh, it's. It's fine, no. It's fine. It's it's a fine theater, but uh, it's it's not uh, it's not rebellious enough, as I said, uh, for me at least today. Concrete Cathedral in Le Rancy, uh, Église Notre Dame du Rancy, 1923, with stained glass work by Marguerite Fure. Uh, I'm glad that it is mentioned also the name of a woman and the name of an artist who worked on the stained glass. The stained glass is very important in this work, and I'm happy that uh, it's not just the architect who is mentioned, but also uh, this artist. Uh, I like this building. You know, it's. I mean, look at the, look at the ceiling. It's heavy. It's it's gray. It's uh, primordial. It's uh, austere. And then we have the luxuries of, of these windows that filter the light, uh, fragment the light. It's, it's, it's almost an impressionistic light, uh, a very different spirit. Here is l'esprit de finesse, and here is l'esprit de, de geometry, uh, to refer to the dichotomy by Boileau, a heavy, uh, you know, almost brutal ceiling. I mean, you could speculate here about what what God means for uh, or meant for uh, Pere. Uh, the exterior is also uh, impressive. He likes, he has, he had these verticals, these slender towers. Uh, he built a few of them. And, uh, um, you know, being that he worked with concrete, reinforced concrete, he was able to uh, go beyond uh, certain limits. Uh, I, I like this interior. I, I particularly like this uh, all the all the photograph. Uh, you know, it, it, it's an architecture here that that uh, uh, doesn't say no to the idea of a church or a cathedral, but at the same time, it asserts uh, um, you know the 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 the, um, the exceptionalism of the artist or the architect who is not uh, complacent, who is not. Uh, who is not uh, willing to renounce his, uh, um, you know, uh, even his idiosyncratic uh, quests or concerns uh, just for the sake of what is called God or the divinity or the above. I, I, it's a building that uh, some might say is, is too emphatically what it is, but uh, uh, 
I don't know. I don't know. Uh, it depends. I mean, it's still a church. It's still, uh, it's still the house of God, so to speak. Although you might say it's also the house of his Pere uh, to an extent. It, it's a good building, I would say. I, we cannot neglect it, no. Uh, and he doesn't reject the ornament. He, he, he's, not, he's obviously quite capable of addressing structure. He is a structuralist, but he also has space for what is called um, the, the infamous ornament in the conception of the Orthodox moderns. Uh, and it is, I, I'm st I still see this tension here between the ceiling and, and the walls, the, the long lateral walls, which are uh, um, filtering the light the way, um, the way this church does. It, 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 it almost gives the impression that this heavy thing above is actually uh, floating. Uh, it's, it's, uh, and at least this is what I see in these pictures. I didn't visit the church, but um, um, from what I see, it's, it's a building that uh, uh, has a lot of qualities. Notre Dame du Rancy, Auguste Perret, 1922. So next year it will be uh, 100 years since its birth uh, of this church. He loved concrete, you can see it uh, everywhere. He loved concrete and his concrete is so different from uh, let's say the concrete of uh, Tadao Ando. Um, it would be maybe interesting to compare the concrete of, of uh, Auguste Perret and the concrete of Tadawando. Not that they are the only ones who used the concrete, of course. But this, the fact that he brings ornament uh, into the building, still using concrete, because that's what it is here, concrete is... Uh, I still see here something that, that, that is of interest to me, this, this meeting between uh, uh, what I call multiplicity and unity. It, 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 these fragments, these small uh, fragments uh, that, that uh, reverberate through the building, but they also claim belonging to a whole, to the whole of the building. Now Perret Tower in Grenoble, 1925, uh, <laughs> and the tower it is. We cannot call it any other way. It is a tower. It's obvious. And uh, um, <laughs> another fine structure by him. Uh, and a little bit uh, enigmatic. Uh, if you look at it, uh, first of all, you don't know its function. Uh, and then uh, uh, you see people are pointing towards it because it's impossible not to point uh, towards it because it's so... Uh, uh, it's such an obvious uh, thing that uh, you have to look at it. I, I don't know what its function is, but even here, you see it's, it's a resolute vertical composed of, of myriad of small things. I mean, besides the structure and look at the structure, you see the concrete is not, it's not perfect. It has so-called imperfections. But I love it as it is. It, it doesn't need to be perfect, so-called and smooth and and uh, you know uh, slick. No, it's actually better in this way. It is raw. R A W. Something Zaha did search for and or she claimed she searched for, but in my opinion didn't arrive at. Auguste Perret did arrive at. This is a, a, a raw architecture. It's also a cultured architecture. This is not just raw. It's some kind of a, a middle ground between rawness and, uh, and um, culturalness. Or, uh, it, and I don't know if it's just be, because of how it was built. Uh, uh, I think the very conception of uh, the architectural conception that Auguste Perret uh, um, um, displays here is one that in its very essence is primal, is ur, is raw. Uh, I like it. Uh, some people might say this is uh, SOS brutalismus, is brut brutalism. I don't know. 
I, I think the sensibility, sometimes the brutalist architect uh, is, uh, is misleading through the, the uh, rawness of, of his works, because behind it, I think, is a, is a sensitive person, a sensitive author, a sensitive architect. And um, that's what I see here. I see a sensitive architect. Uh, again, who doesn't turn his back on what is called uh, uh, ornament, and uh, but this ornament is uh, is uh, uh, is controlled, uh, is allowed to manifest itself, but is not uh, allowed to, um, you know, become crazy, so to speak. It's still controlled by the geometric uh, uh, structure. Thus, the walls. Have um, have a certain character. They they are not just uh, uh, in different walls or, or uh, structures that uh, move upwards. No, they they also uh, ask your eye to 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 stop look to 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 uh, look at uh, at uh, every square inch or square meter or whatever of the building is. It has presence, a presence that is continuous. Um, now, of course, at the base, uh, we have the uh, graffiti artists who are um, eager to cover whatever they, they, they can. But look at the interior. My God. I mean, I think even Lebia Suds would have loved this. You know, it's what is this? It's almost like uh, you take an elevator that. Uh, that uh, that goes with you in a second all the way to God. I mean, this is a I think I would say a futuristic interior, uh, enigmatic, uh, strange, uh, very well built, uh, strong. There is even a spiral here. Yes, you see the spiral within a centralized uh, uh, plan. So. We have, I would say, if I am to risk, um, um, you know, a speculative uh, assertion, uh, it's 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 a space. It's it's a space for both Kronos and Kairos, for both gods of time. Kronos being the god of linear time and Kairos being the god of cyclical time, and that's what I see here. And. Uh, um, uh, I, I think is a is a brilliant uh, interior. Or look here, I, if you just look at this picture, and you didn't know what building it came from or what be, building belongs to, you would be intrigued. You you would have the feeling that this is uh, the work of an architect who, somehow like Boulet, but in a very different way, searched for the same thing: the infinite, the absolute. Boulet did it in his drawings the way he did. Perret did it in his buildings the way he did. Uh, in a certain way, it is the same attempt, but done with different means. La Maison Atelier in uh, Villa Sera, I don't know if Sera lived there or not, 1926, a uh, little building. As you can see, he was able to also build, uh, uh, you know, uh, private uh, houses. It's a small building, but even this building is not a building that you pass by without noticing it. I mean, look, as compared to these buildings, the one by Auguste Perez stands out. Clearly, uh, it has personality, is unique, is enigmatic. It even has two eyes here. It stares at you through these two square eyes. Interesting building. You see, this is the personality of an architect with personality. I'm not saying that these buildings are bad. No, but, but the personality is not as strong as it's in this case. Uh, otherwise, of course, it's, it's a built work. It's not a you know, phantasmagoric uh, you know, uh, building. No, it's, it's rational. It's clearly designed. It's, it was measured. It, but but still it has something. What is that something? That something is the question mark uh, or the exclamation mark or both that architecture, uh, uh, if it is to deserve its name, must 
have and must be. Uh, it's a museum now, uh, and uh, <laughs> it's obvious. Uh, but uh, the building is nice, and even this, um, you know, collection uh, somehow. Uh, art, I think, feels at home inside a building, which is architecture. I, I, even though I know the artists who uh, display their works at the Guggenheim uh, had a different idea and they didn't like the building because the building was overwhelming. Now, I think a, a, a great artist is not overwhelmed by a great building. No, they go together well. Uh, I, I have seen works, great works, at the Guggenheim, and they were not overwhelmed by, by Wright. Uh, so only the, the weaker architect, uh, artists say that uh, a museum like the Guggenheim by Wright uh, overwhelms them now, or makes them uncomfortable or whatever. Anyway, uh, moving forward, uh, the concert hall of the Ecole Normale de Musique de Paris, uh, 1929, uh, a little bit strange this plan because uh, you know it, it's it's uh, kind of a, a, a rather narrow space and and, and the stage is uh, situated here not uh, here uh, but uh, it works he, you know it's an existing building he didn't build the building he just uh, accommodated that uh, concert hall within an existing building you already recognize the facade by by Auguste Perret, he uses the square, he uses a very you know, simple, strict geometry. Uh, he's austere, he's an austere architect. Look at the, the drone facade. It's difficult to get something simpler. Uh, so the section, the section uh, of what he proposed and built, and here it is. Um, yeah, Auguste Perret again in Paris. Uh, it's a small, I mean, small, it's a smaller concert hall, but uh, it works. Now, Hotel Saint Georges in Beirut, in Lebanon, 1932. Uh, it's this one, not this one, it's this one. Uh, anyway, sorry for the, for the advertising. I couldn't find great pictures with it. This is the plan. Um, what can we say? Yes, it's a hotel, a corridor and rooms, almost all of them identical. Uh, and uh, you see, if we have to comment a little bit on the architecture of Perot, of Perret, sorry, again, I, I make this mistake, Perret, uh, is uh, uh, he, he, he does believe in geometry. He does believe in the strictness of geometry. Although he has a work, and you, you are going to see it, which will surprise you, and I still don't believe it was him who did it, and I can't wait to arrive at it and wonder if indeed it is by him. Uh, you'll realize what I'm talking about very soon. Anyway, this is in, in, in Lebanon. Uh, as you can see, it has something here that disappeared uh, after a while, uh, you know, uh, Beirut, uh, Lebanon, uh, the trouble place. I don't know what happened here, but the building I still, th I think, uh, still exists, uh, although a little modified. Uh, Immeuble Lange uh, in the Port de Passy in Paris, uh, again, the same uh, uh, strategy, architectural strategy, rigor. Uh, strictness, uh, solidity, uh, but uh, and, and concrete, of course. He, he, he never gives up on concrete. He's very loyal to this material that Frank Lloyd Wright considered a, a conglomerate. That's what uh, Frank Lloyd Wright said about uh, uh, concrete. He actually didn't like concrete too much, and that he called it a conglomerate. Um, although he used it a, a few times, but uh, I, I, I would say rather reluctantly. Uh, not Pere. Pere loved concrete uh, and loved a square and loved, uh, loved uh, it's something very, uh, just that, very square about his architecture. Now, this is a, a building with a strange name, Service Technique de Construction Naval. Uh, an example of a framework of exposed concrete columns 
uh, I didn't find great pictures of it. Not, uh, I found this one, but uh, I don't know. I mean, maybe maybe uh, Auguste Perret can be a little bit uh, uh, challenged with the question, how do you marry the modernity of, uh, of, uh, of, 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 of the concrete structures that you advocated with a certain classicism? It's actually kind of interesting to compare since uh, fate decided to uh, give birth to both Boulet and Perret on the same day, but not the same year, to compare the neoclassicism of Boulet, if indeed that's what it is, with a certain almost neoclassical uh, touch in the works of, of Perret. Uh, because there is a certain uh, uh, connection between uh, neoclassicism or classicism and, uh, and Perret. Uh, uh, if there is a romantic uh, side to Perret, it's not because of the way he handles geometry. Uh, it's because of other things, like, for example, the use of, of uh, fields, uh, ornamental fields, like in the church that we saw, uh, or the vibration of the of the skin uh, of that uh, very tall and slender tower that we also saw. But this building, I have a feeling somehow, uh, I also will see the works by him in Le Havre, which are different from what he built in uh, in Paris are not so affected by the Osmanian uh, culture of, of, of Paris. I think uh, in Paris, but not always, you, you saw that apartment building on Rue Frank Franklin, uh, there he's not, uh, he was not marked by, uh, um, you know, uh, obsessional uh, neoclassical uh, uh, longings. Using the horlogerie, uh, <laughs> an interesting using, you know, factory, 1939-1943, so it, it was finalized the construction during the war. I like this, this, this build, this part of the building is, 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 uh, it's genuine uh, Auguste Perret. It, it, it has uh, this solidity, this, uh, this, um, this presence is, 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 uh, I don't know if I'm inspired now enough to, 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 to verbalize properly about it, but I have a feeling here is Perret at, 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 at his most uh, Auguste Perret. It's, uh, it's, uh, there is the structure, there is the, the opaqueness, there is the concrete, there is the, the rigor of the geometry, the symmetry. It's uh, maybe not so much what's behind it. You are going to see it. Uh, but but this part of the building is 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 very Auguste Perret. Uh, it was for uh, if you if you have the money you can buy it. I mean I don't know if they still have the if it's still on on, on sale. Not that it interests me, but uh, it would be interesting now to uh, <laughs> to just tell a friend I just bought a, a, a factory designed by Auguste Perret. If you don't mind, uh, we could do something there. Um, uh, you know, a factory inside, well, for for uh, orlogerie, for uh, <laughs> minute work, they didn't need an impressive space like uh, uh, Wright envisioned at the Larkin building, that great building by Frank Lloyd Wright, which was uh, leveled by some very poetically oriented people who wanted to make a parking lot. Can you believe it? In the enlightened the United States of America, they leveled one of the best buildings by Frank Lloyd Wright in order to make a parking lot. Welcome to wisdom. Uh, anyway, uh, a building on uh, Rue Reynoir, uh, where he had his offices. Attention, he had his offices in this building. This is the building. I know he lived on the seventh floor. So let's see which one is the seventh. We start from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yes, obviously the king had to live there. That's where he lived. And I think, I imagine that's where he had his offices. Not bad at all. This is what a successful architect can afford. 
uh, and um, I don't know exactly what is here. I, I notice it now. It's, it's, it's some kind of a mythological creature or some kind of an animal. Um, strange. Uh, anyway, um, otherwise it's an apartment building, but you see the windows, the way they are made, you see the, clearly the structure, the concrete structure. It's, 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 it's clearly a, a, a modernistic uh, uh, gesture. And uh, I, I'm not so sure about this. I, I, I don't know if it was not modified in time. Uh, this seems to be in a different, uh, uh, a different aesthetical uh, uh, palette, or I don't know how to describe it. This is Pere, no doubt, but I'm not sure about this. Uh, although it's part of the same building, but it doesn't look like, uh, like a Pere building there at all. The plan, we are dealing with an architect who knew how to draw uh, convincing plans. Look at it, it's, it's, it would have received a prize uh, at the, uh, at the uh, Le Col de Bozar uh, very, very well. Uh, you know, it's, it's certainly a plan that uh, um, Massimiliano Fuchsas perhaps would have avoided to make, but, uh, you know, uh, a good architect uh, sensitive to beauty would still appreciate it, even if we have different convictions now. Uh, but all in all, we see structure. It's clearly, it's clear to me that Auguste Perret believed in the structure, but somehow uh, is able to make the, the structure uh, long for something else as well. I don't know if I, if I, if I, um, if I added anything with the last words, but I have a feeling he is a, he is a structuralist, but, uh, but somehow he's not, uh, uh, I don't know, I, I don't find out the right words. Um, I, he, he's not obsessional. Uh, his architecture is not dry. This is what I'm trying to get at. Although he uses, you know, concrete, but look at the top of the building. Here is a, uh, you know, it's not really a, a tree a la Su Fujimoto. It doesn't, but, but it is an attempt towards some kind of architectural coiffure. And uh, as such, it's, it's a different mentality of, of it's a different kind of, of, of structuralist. I like the fact that he doesn't need to embellish uh, his concrete. He allows it to be raw, uh, rough, uh, grayish. I, I always uh, thought that uh, with all respect and affection for Le Corbusier, uh, who, who was longing or writing about uh, when, the, when the cathedrals were white, only cathedral at the Blanche. In my opinion, the cathedrals were never white. I don't know what, uh, what Le Corbusier uh, imagined, but in my opinion, the cathedrals were never white because stone was never white. I mean, stone is rather grayish. And uh, uh, kind of like what we see here. Uh, so the idea that the cathedrals once were splendidly white, this was the, the idea of someone who conceived uh, Villa Savoie, but, but I don't think the cathedrals were ever white, um, nor the Greek temples for that matter, who were highly chromatic, uh, polychromatic. Look at the interior. Uh, this is the apartment of the master. Not bad at all. Uh, um, you know, he was an architect who was able, I mean, he was a shoemaker who also knew how to make shoes for himself. Uh, <clears throat> I love the, the concrete column that is left just like that, concrete, and emerging from the floor uh, with its uh, uh, proudness uh, and proudness. Um, there is even here a little bit a touch of classicism, uh, but there is also the, the, the vigor and the non-conventionality of, 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 the, of the, the exposed concrete. Um, I think any great creator in any field uh, uh, betrays, he has to betray, she has to betray is not enough just to bow your head in front of what preceded you. 
call it tradition or whatever, you also have to betray. And the, in the act of betrayal, you generate what is called usually innovation. You innovate. Well, this column is an innova innovation. Uh, you would not have seen in, in the past before Perret easily such a column inside such an apartment with a lot of wood and, you know, rather, you know, bourgeois and comfortable and so on. Mobilier National. This is a, a, a large building where Hermes, the famous uh, fashion uh, aristocrat, uh, so to speak, um, uh, had uh, at one moment a uh, fashion show. And unfortunately, I, I, I've, I, there is a video with it, which is very nice, but I don't have it active here. Hermes took over Paris Mobilier National for its menswear show. And this is what, this is how the building by Perret looked like in that day, that evening when Hermes, a uh, very expensive uh, fashion uh, uh, label, um, rented the space. What is the space for? Is a, is a, some kind of a museum, of um, a state museum of, uh, I don't know, state furniture. I, it isn't very clear to me what that means. Maybe furniture, mobilier that was used in, um, you know, institutions in France or something like this. And so the building belongs to, to that function, but it was rented in this case for uh, Hermes. And look at them here. <laughs> I, I love modernity. Uh, I also love eternity. That's why I love Boulet. But I also love fashion. And look at them. I think that, I mean, yes, you know, maybe Oscar Wilde was correct when he said, uh, fashion is so ugly that you, we have to change it every six months. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> these four um, young men, you know, coming towards us with a, uh, you know, Sakosh with the uh, you know bags are still uh, entertaining us, uh, uh, although they look a little bit morose. But this is how uh, um, the fashion models uh, are, are taught, I think, to to act. Uh, they never smile. They look very, very, you know, uh, self-centered and introverted, and even uh, kind of sad. In in, in. anyway, uh, this is in the building. Uh, rented uh, from uh, Auguste Perret, so to speak, by Hermes. Now we go, uh, we go to this is, it's a large story space for all kinds of furnitures. And indeed we see furnitures that are not very avant-garde. They are indeed uh, state mobilier, uh, le mobilier de l'état. Is, is, uh, is, is a furniture. Uh, here we see some other things is true, a little bit extravagant. But all in all, it's uh, maybe it's a sad museum. I, I don't know. The building, though, is not sad. Yes, it's it's symmetrical. It's central. It's centralized. Uh, it has a sense of dignity that is self-assumed and uh, uh, maybe too explicitly exposed. Uh, you will see even some pictures with a red uh, carpet. Um, uh, Yes, it's a building that says uh, uh, l'esprit de géométrie comes first. And then if we have some time and space for l'esprit de finesse, we'll talk. But first is l'esprit de géométrie, the spirit, uh, the geometric spirit, the spirit of uh, geometry, uh, le mobilier national. Uh, a nice detail here, though, you know, it, it's... Uh, um, Maybe I should just be silent and look at it for a few minutes and then maybe uh, uh, say something uh, worth uh, saying. I know I like it. <laughs> Why exactly I like it right now, I cannot say, but I like what I see. And you could ask very well, well what is here to like? Uh, it's, you know, two beams crossing each other, intersecting, and what, I don't know what it is, but I have a feeling there was a good architect here. All right, moving forward. And please don't forget, not tomorrow, but the day after tomorrow, it will be a celebration, a paying homage to Alberti. That very Alberti that Peter Eisenman at 88 is very, very interested in and concerned with. 
Uh, and I, 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 I love this fact about Peter Eisenman. I attended five lectures by him on Palladio, and now approaching 90, being 90, he's studying, and I think he even published something about Alberti. I'm going to send an invitation to his office and to him. I don't have expectations he will show up, but we'll pay homage to Alberti, the first architect, as he is usually known, as opposed to Brunelleschi, who is considered the last carpenter, that is, not tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, the birthday of, of, of the great Alberti. And here we see the, <laughs> you know, I talked about centrality, no? Well, the French are born revolutionaries, but they also love, as you can see, the red carpet, the, the, the flag right in the center. They love authority, they love centrality. They, they, they love what they hate in a way. You know, they rebel against authority, but at the same time, I don't think they can live without the, the emperor, without the king. Uh, look, look, what else do we see in this red carpet? You know, I mean, just look at this picture. How could it be in the same city where the revolutionaries uh, uh, attacked uh, the Bastille? Here we have this red carpet restoring that very order that the revolutionaries and Marianne fought against. Anyway, by the way of Marianne, now is the time to tell you, uh, sorry for this, uh, this accidental uh, uh, intervention, but I want to say, I had this idea that right in front of uh, Notre Dame de Paris, the cathedral, the cathedral that of course was built for Notre Dame, for Marie, to have another building for Marie Anne, the symbol of, of the French Revolution. Thus to have two buildings, one facing the other one, face to face, the sacred and the profane. Notre Dame de Paris built for Marie. Uh, the other building which was not built, but could be built, and there is space in front of the cathedral, a building for Marie Anne, the symbol of the French Revolution. Liberté, égalité, fraternité. Thus, two women facing each other at Point Zero in Paris, because that's where Point Zero, the zero point is, that's where you may begin to measure the distances uh, within the city of Paris. I think it would be interesting to have two ladies, Marie and Marianne, facing each other right at Point Zero in Paris like a new beginning for the whole world, not just for Paris and not just for France. Anyway, Palais Jena in Paris, 1937, originally built as the Museum of Public Works for the 1937 Paris, uh, Paris Exposition, now home of the French Economic, Social and Environmental Council. Wow, it sounds impressive. Uh, we see this again, and this is the building. It does match the, its naming now and its function. But inside there are, I mean, here we see Auguste Perret at his uh, uh, liking of, uh, of centrality and, uh, you know, neoclassical or classical, um, you know, longings or aspirations. But inside we see the innovator more. First, the structure. He's so good at this, this uh, uh, exposed concrete which has vigor, it has, uh, it has a positive masculinity, uh, which is not aggressive. It's just, uh, an, uh, in a way, it, it's the noble savage that Le Corbusier aspired towards being, uh, the noble savage. These, these columns, I, I could approximate them with these words, noble savages. Uh, the stair, Yes, the, the parapet is maybe conventional, a little bit conventional, and maybe even a beginning of the stair. It doesn't quite have the power of that stair, the tumultuous stair that is a lava that descends from Biblioteca Laurentiana by Michelangelo in Florence. It doesn't have that power. But uh, once you go beyond the, the beginning and uh, you ignore the, the parapets, some interesting things happen here, and you'll see there is uh, there are some contortions. Uh, all in all, is a good uh, staircase. 
yeah, the building is as it is, a little bit uh, stiff, I would say. Sorry, August Pere, and I, I do admire you a lot, but it is a little bit official for my taste, a little bit too official. But interior, the interior still has, um, and although the columns are just uh, cylinders, uh, but but it's something about them that they, they escape banality. And, and I, I think it's a good interior, all in all. Uh, the stair yeah, is not as raw as it could have been, but uh, maybe it was not the place here for too much rawness. Um, somehow it looks better in black and white, I think. A less bourgeois. Extension to the Ecole Nationale, but here I don't think I found pictures. No, I didn't. Now we, we, we see a large building. I don't know exactly what it is, CEA de Secle. Uh, it's again a typical uh, Auguste Perret. Um, it is a kind of, uh, of a French variation of on some kind of, uh, uh, I mean, I don't know, maybe we can talk a little bit about authority and uh, Auguste Perez architecture. This, this, this particular building does have a, a certain, uh, uh, I mean, you, you could see certain echoes from uh, certain architecture that I would rather not mention now, uh, but uh, anyway. But uh, here I like, I like this corner. This, it shows, I think this is his spirit. Here, he's inventive, he's uh, creative, he's uh, uh, subtle, uh, he's also uh, resolute. Uh, I, in this corner, I think Perret is at his best. Uh, and, and it's both uh, somehow uh, moving forward and moving inwardly. Uh, so there is the double uh, uh, movement, uh, uh, centripetal and centrif centrifugal. I would say it's just a detail, uh, maybe, but uh, it's a good so-called detail. Anyway, uh, moving forward. This also is a restaurant, but uh, look at the, the, the top part of the space. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a vigorous uh, structure here that brings nobility and force to the, to the space. Underneath is what it is, tables and chairs. But uh, above is something else. Above, we have architecture. That's what we have. City Hall, St. Joseph's Church, and further reconstruction of the French. We are approaching the end of the presentation of the French city of Le Havre. After more than 80,000 inhabitants of that city were left homeless following World War II. We better think again about launching another war. And this was not the biggest tragedy, of course. There were others, horrible. No, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and all those uh, uh, terrible inventions of the Second World War that uh, killed so many people. It is incredible that human beings can do such atrocious things. You know, people who go to museums, I mean, you know, those officers in the German army, they loved art. They stole art. They made, uh, you know, uh, how could it be? How could you love art and, 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 and generate deadly wars? It's beyond me. Anyway, we'll look first at the city hall, then some apartment buildings. He did build a lot in Le Havre. And I'm very happy that an architect of his caliber uh, was in charge with this. The city hall, now, of course, you could say it's, it's too strict, uh, too uh, regular, too... Uh, no, no, it's a city hall built at a certain time, but uh, I still think it has dignity. And uh, yeah, the architecture is a little, a little bit dictated, um, particularly perhaps this, this part of it, the horizontal part, but uh, you know, not not in a in an unbearable way. And the French flag is still uh, flying there with a certain pride. Apartment buildings, I like. I have seen some of these. I have been in Le Havre, and I remember they do have presence. They do have power. They do say, "I am architecture." Uh, sorry for the alami. These people ruin 
great pictures with a, a sign of uh, possession. What can you do? Um, So the, these are apartment buildings, um, you know, rebuilding the city after the destruction of the Second World War. Uh, apartment buildings, and I imagine they were not even, you know, they are not destined for, for the elite. But you had uh, uh, one of the best architects uh, building them. Now a church, a good church, uh, St. Joseph's Church in Le Havre, we kind of know by now how he builds, uh, especially churches. Uh, he loves slender towers. And here we also have uh, 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 the, the seductiveness of, uh, of an interior space that aspires towards the, the vertical infinite. This is, a, this is an interior that uh, deserves to be uh, placed uh, to be placed uh, in the vicinity of the best uh, drawings of Poulet and uh, the best architecture by Khan. We can mention various architectures that, uh, I mean, you know, what we see here uh, with a different scale is the ceiling of Exeter Library by Khan, you know? and But it's a vertical space that is very monumental. It, it has a genuine uh, uh, vertical impetus. Uh, this this church uh, is, uh, I would say, one of the best uh, modern buildings of, of, of churches. And again, this this uh, uh, vertical vortex, this this uh, uh, channel, vertical channel uh, that is uh, so, uh, uh, you know, uh, is is is, uh, is is so inviting, uh, and at the same time a little bit. Uh, uh, scaring because it seems to this ascension seems to never end. Uh, it's 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 probably his spirit. He he aspired towards the above, and uh, he has like in the other works that we saw uh, this this way of of, of uh, treating glass uh, in a in a, in a different way than his uh, structure and the building itself. Glass. He, he he works on the glass uh, in, 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 with a different paradigm. Uh, uh, he fragments the glass, something that we don't do these days. Um, so there are these slight, I mean, these uh, ornamental rugs on the not uh, green, uh, not uh, not vertical uh, forests or gardens, but uh, uh, these these windows are. Uh, um, uh, fragmentations of light that uh, um, bring nature into the building through the light they filter in a in a specific way, in an impression impressionistic way, and the tower of the church is uh, the the climax of the church. Look at this. I mean, this is really about uh, the dialogue between the human beings and the gods. I don't know if I, I would say the God, maybe the gods or God, it doesn't really matter. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tunnel, it's a vertical tunnel uh, pointing towards the above. Here, Perret is showing his uh, powers of invention. He's not bourgeois any longer. Uh, sorry again about this salami thing, but uh, um, it's a fine building, especially uh, the, in, in the interior. Look at this. And look at this. Monumentality and filter light. Um, it's a, I, I would say it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a commentary on, uh, uh, maybe on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on the meaning of, 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 no, I don't want to use big words, but I'm thinking of that uh, phrase that uh, the world is a sphere whose uh, 
periphery is nowhere and how center is everywhere. And uh, it's something like this that I see here. Anyway, we move forward, we are approaching the end, but we still, you'll be surprised, and I still don't know, I made this presentation uh, some while ago, and I, I'm not sure the next work is really his. I'm afraid it might not be, uh, because it's so different, and I, 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 I forgot to verify. Anyway, we'll arrive at it. If it is a mistake from my side, I will apologize, uh, honestly. Apartment building in Le Havre, uh, this is um, still Le Havre, we are still there, and as I read uh, before, I think uh, this whole uh, part designed and built by, uh, designed by uh, Auguste Perret is uh, honored by UNESCO as a um, heritage uh, uh, place. You know. Look at this architecture, you would say, well, what's so special? It's a rationalistic architecture and so on, so on. No, 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 it, it's more than it. It, it, it has a character, it has a, uh, an integrity. It, it, I don't know, I'm probably now a little bit too tired to, to explain uh, eloquently or, or, or uh, uh, adequately, but... Uh, this is not an indifferent architecture. I mean, it's not just building, it is architecture, I think. I don't know about this part, as I said, but the tower is still uh, architecture, at least to an extent. Uh, we have seen some of these, um, uh, somehow he built a lot, he rebuilt Le Havre, uh, and uh, he is here, but where is he? Uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, all these buildings were built by him. He believed in architecture, no doubt. Oh, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't see again this presentation. I made it a few years ago and I knew it was a work that it didn't look like, uh, like uh, Auguste Perret. Well, it is in Le Havre, but of course it's not by, by Auguste Perret, it's by Oscar Niemeyer. But I am happy, it looks so much like Niemeyer that I was sure it cannot be uh, Auguste Perret. The reason I show it is for the, sa is the, same, uh, uh, is the same reason that I show those works by MVRDV and the Sphere in, in Tijuana, because I think it's important to show you know, certain uh, correspondence, certain relationships, and he built, we saw what, uh, what uh, Auguste Perret did in, uh, in Le Havre, and now we see a work by Niemeyer, Oscar Niemeyer, also in Le Havre, and this is it. Uh, <laughs> obviously, this is not by, by Le Havre, he, by, by, uh, by uh, Auguste Perret, even if he drank a lot, he would not have designed something like this. You see, we have two great architects, Auguste Perret, and in this case, uh, Oscar Niemeyer. Their architecture is so fundamentally different. So, you know, uh, as the motto or the logo of, uh, of uh, the secession movement on the secession building in Vienna says, to each time it's art and to each art it's freedom. That's what it is. Niemeyer built very differently from Auguste Perret. Uh, in the same city, and, and it, it should be in this way because, the, well, the times are different and the architects are different. Who is better? Could we say uh, Niemeyer is better than Auguste Perret or Auguste Perret is better than Niemeyer? Uh, maybe the question shouldn't be addressed. They're different architects, very different architects. Maybe we could say that Oscar Niemeyer sometimes is a little bit too decorative almost in his fluidity of forms of spaces and uh, that maybe Auguste Perret not enough, maybe. I don't know, I could be wrong. But I'm happy that a city assumes various kinds of architecture because the life of a city should be just that, uh, alive.
So we have the dialogue between uh, Auguste Perret and Oscar Niemeyer. A nice dialogue, I would say. Gare d'Amiens, we have two more works to show. Uh, so a few more minutes, if you are so kind, 1955. Here we have again uh, <laughs> uh, the typical um, slender uh, Auguste Perret Tower, and then uh, more horizontal buildings. Uh, the interior is also, I would say, uh, it is austere, but uh, it's, it's still convincing as architecture. Um, I am sure that even Peter Eisenman would have liked it, uh, although he, uh, in some projects, he questioned the validity of the grid, but he also stated that all projects should start with a grid. Well, that's what we have here, grids. Um, how Auguste Perret betrayed them, I don't know. Maybe in the facades, he didn't betray them sufficiently. Um, I wouldn't say this is a very convincing uh, uh, facade, but uh, the tower is still has uh, its power, uh, and uh, he is good at building these um, uh, fast uh, towers. And this is the last work I show. It's a villa in Alexandria in Egypt, which was destroyed. Uh, partial attempt to destroy. <laughs> terrible words in August 2009 and destroyed completely by 21st of January 2016. So just five years ago, this villa, this building by him in, in Egypt was destroyed. This is how it looked like uh, when it was still alive. Not a very good picture, but uh, what can I do? Here you see two pictures, how it looked like uh, on the right and how it became on the left, the human uh, uh, ability to uh, hit uh, its own creations and destroy. Um, it's sad, no? <clears throat> it, it is sad. It is sad. I, I don't know. If, I, I only hope they didn't destroy it in order to build a so-called build a parking lot, like in the case of the Larkin building by Wright. Uh, and it, it wouldn't be a large parking lot anyway, because it was a much smaller building. But it is sad. It is sad when a building built by a, a very important architect is destroyed. Um, we should all weep, I think, and not just in the name of a uh, maybe predictable, uh, the maybe often present architectonic narcissism. No, we should weep. In, in fact, uh, uh, if anything of value is destroyed, we should weep. Not just architecture, not just buildings, uh, anything. And look at this. This is the last picture of this presentation. And uh, we have to face it. Uh, our works are uh, perishable. Uh, and uh, um, sooner or later, either the elements or other human beings uh, uh, do something to, to ruin even the most uh, uh, noble um, efforts. Uh, thank you. Uh, no. uh, what did I do? Okay, there are here still uh, 